Hey everyone, it's Dr. Rick, and today's tutorial is on statins, cholesterol, and heart attack risk. If this is the first time you're finding me, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below and the alert button to find out when I do new videos. So if you're not my patient, you might want to take this information and take it to your doctor because this is not meant to substitute for medical advice. However, I will try to summarize in this tutorial the approach that I give most of my patients, especially after COVID. In 1977, there was a New York blackout. It was associated with riots and uh, poor economy, but it was there's some documentation that within nine months of that blackout, there was a little bit of a New York City baby boom. So I'd like to think in a nice way that as COVID starts to become less of an issue, you'll probably have not a baby boom, but you'll have a fat boom, a diabetes boom, a cholesterol boom. And then five to 10 years after 2021, you're gonna have a heart attack boom and a stroke boom. So that's the reality of this thing. And I'll present to you, if um, this might be a little bit in the weeds, but I'll present to you a couple of pieces of information that I came up with. And yes, I uh, researched Don't just, stay in isolation, eat your sorrow away, and wait to the last minute, we're going to get over this COVID thing. Now, if by the time we get over it, your five to 10 pounds up, or your cholesterol has gone up, or your triglycerides have gone up, HDL has gone down, uh, insulin responsiveness is terrible, then you're gonna be behind the eight ball, and you have a lot of work to do. So don't wait until you have a lot, start to prepare now. So I'd like to say, Keep on sheltering in place, use your mask, wash your hands, keep your distance, but also start planning because summer's coming. Whether COVID is here or not, summer's coming. And in Chicago, we look forward to summer. And it might still be lockdown, but there's a lot more freedom when the summer sun and the temperatures are a little better. And that's when I want all my warriors to get back on and crack the whip. The only problem with uh, sheltering in place is that you're a little limited in what you can do. Uh, as far as exercise, and I always say that exercise is important, but sustainability is even more important. And when you exercise at home, I think there's something boring about it that just cuts off your sustainability. Nutrition is also a little limited now, which we'll get into. Um, and some people aren't working. And uh, the idea is when you don't have that salary coming in, you got to pinch your pennies and try to buy only the essentials. And sometimes the cheaper food is gonna be the worst food. So we'll give you guidance. This is gonna be a, a, probably a three-part series because the same things I'm suggesting for you here will be the same things to take care of cancer. And cancer is somewhat a chronic disease now because you kill the cancer the first time, reset everything, and your chances for a second cancer are high. So This just shows that there is treatment and investigative information is, is well, very robust as far as certain things that seem to be accumulated to get you to a heart attack or a stroke. So that's, let me repeat that. Uh, we can follow the timeline of heart attack and stroke and then the general statistics of the whole population to figure out, is there an associated link? So that's where data is really important. Now, there is a lot of bias out there, especially if the data is produced by a, a pharmaceutical company. So you have to be careful with what you read. But by the same token, I have some people that just are adamant with a conspiracy theory that statins are just big pharma, don't uh, follow any of the restrictive guidelines, don't worry about LDL cholesterol. Hopefully I'll be able to present an argument for you here that will give you guidance and a, at least direction. So uh, there's great information that's out there that cannot be refuted. There's a lot of crappy information too, so you have to be cautious about what you read. But uh, here's one study. It just showing that modulating blood levels does help for a while to control disease. Modulating blood levels, meaning that if you go to the doctor's office, even if you came to my office, I will do whatever the insurance company covers as far as blood testing. Your it got BMI, your weight, your height, your activities, your nutrition pattern. I take all that into account in addition to the blood test results. And I put it all together, shake it up, and I present the plan for you. And everybody needs a different plan. I'll show you why. And when we cookie cutter everybody's plan to be, everybody has to be with this LDL, this cholesterol, and we'll use this blood test, and we'll use this medicine. 
I mean, we try, we're trying that now, but the population is morphing into pre-diabetics. And I, I do believe that pre-diabetes insulin resistance is more of a harbinger of uh, upcoming heart attack or stroke than uh, the old LDL or the old total cholesterols that we used to follow. But, in, but regardless, I will do whatever's covered by your insurance, but I think we need more than that. So, and hopefully you'll agree with me after this. So uh, this is a, uh, that's shadowing us off. Sorry about that. This is a model that showed that there's a, a protein that's within, let me, let me backtrack. Uh, when we do the standard uh, markers of total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and then sometimes non-HDL, I think those, that standard blood test is adequate. It's directional, but it is so lacking. So that, as I mentioned before, the data in the last 50 years, as far as LDL and, and, and particle and, and this thing called LP little a and apoprotein, the lipid particles, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, those all, LDL stands for low density lipoprotein. HDL stands for high density lipoprotein. And that's the good guy. And, but really there shouldn't be a good and bad, there should be a balance. So uh, that's what we classically use to figure out if we pull the trigger on getting you a statin, at least not me, but my colleagues. And watching your trajectory, I would always say first change lifestyle. And if you can't get somebody to help you change lifestyle, and if you still can't do that, fix deficiency. If you still can't do that, then we have to do medicines, at least until you're ready to go back to lifestyle. Unfortunately, my colleagues either don't have the training or they're just lazy and they go straight to saying LDL hasn't changed in three months. Here you go. Here's your medicine. Or if you don't want to take the medicine, go see a cardiologist. And cardiologists have more training, but I've seen some cardiologists that don't do a good job. And sometimes lazy medicine's faster until you have a heart attack. And, and then the procedures are coming. And that technically is lazy too, because I mean, when you have a stent put in and you don't make suggestions on change of lifestyle, Nobody remembers what to do with the stent. They just remember going to the emergency room, having some procedure, kind of spooky, but then walking out of the hospital same day feeling great. No more chest pain. And that's uh, usually not a threat. It it's reverses your symptoms fast. But if you look at the statistics, it still projects that person into the same timeline of a bypass in about six years or a second stent. So again, it goes back to whether you have a procedure or not to rescue your symptoms, it still goes back to lifestyle. So, um, yes, so there are proteins called APOs, uh, APOB, APOS3C. We don't have to get, that's too much into the weeds. You'll have to read on your own, but this is just a study that showed how they took apart the APO proteins that were in, involved with all the lipoproteins, and they kind of figured out, okay, not only do we know which lipoproteins are bad, or the fractions of lipoproteins that we're supposed to follow. We also know that there's proteins in the lipoproteins that have this quality. Some of them have the quality of putting you into a heart attack. It's LDL and HDL. Bad cholesterol, LDL. Good cholesterol, HDL. They're meant to be spherical. And because they are spherical, uh, they can sit in the bloodstream. Now, the liver makes most of these, if not all. And it sends it out into the bloodstream, so the, the sphere... Uh, deposits triglycerides, which are energy sources, and it goes back to the liver to get more energy sources. Now, the problem is there's other things in that sphere, not only just the energy packets called triglycerides, and some of you have way too many energy packets, way too high of a triglyceride level, which is what I was alluding to earlier, but not only do you drop off those triglycerides to other cells, muscle, gland, um, but you also sometimes will have those little protein particles that if they come in contact with muscle gland, blood vessel wall, they cause irritation. And that's the crux of the problem is that this little sphere that's supposed to travel everywhere and serve you to deliver the energy molecule, it also delivers some bad stuff. And if you happen to have a bad diet, you have nastier spheres. If you have a really good diet and exercise, you have powerful spheres. So typically the HDL, or that's why I'm going over here, the HDL or good cholesterol uh, is tinier, has a certain amount of protein and a limited amount of uh, cholesterol. It also carries some triglycerides. The LDL or bad cholesterol is usually, it goes from super tiny 
to really fluffy and buoyant. But the determination between tiny and buoyant is the amount of fat or the amount of triglycerides. It also is the amount of protein or APOs, and the apoproteins uh, will have that magnetic attraction and until it drops it off to wherever you have to deliver energy packets to. So hopefully that's a little bit of a shortcut, uh, truncated version of what these things are for, because you need them, you need bad and you need good, uh, you need total and you need triglycerides. But sometimes, it's obvious, old school, you know, but if you eat too many energy packets and the wrong type of energy packets, something's going to give. So you know, nowadays, with uh, the way the food industry makes things look good, taste good, makes things high in carbohydrates and sugar, it's hard to stop that crap. So uh, I admit at one point in time when I was really into exercise, I would usually want to get uh, uh, caffeine in me right before the exercise. And I had a reflux issue, so I stopped the coffee and I just went to short bursts of caffeine, which uh, because it was available, I would stop and get uh, either Red Bull or a Monster. This was a while ago and um, it tasted good. And I, I guess there was a little bit of an energy burst. I don't know. It was probably more of a sugar insulin dump. But I got it was hard to stop that because the taste buds wanted to have that sweetness again and maybe a little bit of the caffeine burst again and whatever crap is in there. So it was hard to stop until I eventually got rid of the reflux issue, started back on green tea, a healthy green tea, and I didn't and I fixed my sleep. So I didn't need that empowered feeling of energy before my workouts. So that's an important thing, sleep and stress relief. So well, we'll save that for a later day in the cancer talk. With the average American diet, especially in COVID, because we're all locked down, uh, everybody's apprehensive about going to the gym, and it's cold out. So I, I'm a winter hiker, so I'm outside all the time. But we have a lot of people that are going through weight gain and that prediabetes state. Uh, when you have a lot of carbohydrates or a lot of sugary foods or hidden sugar, high fructose, uh, you can have a ton of insulin that chases every bite, every swallow, every meal that's of that design. And when the insulin spikes, it eventually goes down. But the more you spike throughout the day insulin, even if you just do a lot of refined uh, carbohydrates, the more you spike throughout the day, and when the insulin drops, it makes you hunt for more carbohydrate again. So it's a bad cycle. However, uh, this is typical for uh, the eating pattern of COVID. So uh, isolation, depression, all of it, uh, cheapness of the food, all of it leads to prediabetes state, essentially insulin resistance. And uh, I have found in the last five years that I will do the standard blood test, total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, uh, triglycerides, and maybe non-HDL. But it, just as a metric, I, I, I'll tell you why I don't like them. But I've also thrown in insulins in the morning and glucose or hemoglobin A1Cs. I'm finding that the metrics of the cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, they were there. Usually there's a high triglyceride level, but the metrics of insulin and glucose were even a better indicator that we got to move our asses here. So uh, this is a study that was done that just showed or, or revealed the importance that the community now is going really high with triglycerides, really low with HDL. Would you rather go for bypass or stent procedure? Or, would you ra or a ton of statins and other medicines for cholesterol? Or would you just try to work on your insulin resistance? So I know it's hard to work on that stuff, but that's what you have to do on your own. When you're in a doctor's office, average doctor would do lazy medicine. Here's your statin. Here's your metformin. Here's your glucophage. See me in three months after your blood test, and we'll see if you're healthier. And it's not that you're healthier, it just is your uh, list of medicines is growing. And if you're not healthier, then your list of medicines will be added to with your next doctor visit or your next specialty visit. So be on your guard. I have a lot of guys in their 30s and 40s and gals too that say, I'll, I'll show them the blood test results and they'll say, well, I feel fine and, and I, I'm okay. I don't smoke, I exercise. But I give them that forewarning. And I've been told that sometimes if I have to result in threat incentive, some patients don't take that. I remember seeing a review online. A uh, person said, I don't shake hands with them. And that uh, I was just throwing threats. Well, FYI, if you don't bite into the, the personal design thing that I would present to you, 
then the next default is I have to give you the possibilities of what's going to happen if you don't change. Or if I'm not inspirational for, in, enough for you, then here's the other threats that, of what might happen. And it, it, listen, even if I'm not inspirational enough for you, you can go see other people and find your way. But bottom line is you, you got to change. And most Americans, 80% of the patients I see, you have to change. If you don't, then you will become symptomatic, whether it's a heart attack or a stroke or just numbness and tingling. Or for some reason, the doctors you're seeing are getting more and more medicines on your list. Imagine going to the doctor's office at the age of 70 with like 15 different medicines. And then some of those are medicines to take care of the side effects from the medicines. Or some of those are medicines to take care of the procedure you just had. It's just terrible. So bottom line is you have to have a healthy lifestyle. And I, you know, I'm always working on mine. It's a constant race and a challenge to stay independent, not have a procedure, not have a medicine on board, and watch your great-great-grandkids. A lot so, of cardiologists will follow your total cholesterol and LDL. And if your LDL isn't to spec, they'll hammer it down with there's statins, there's fibrates, there's niacin, there's... Uh, uh, a new class, uh, well, Zedia is a class by itself, and then there's new classes of uh, things called PCSK9 inhibitors. If you can't get to where you have to get to, then the medicines will work. Are there side effects of the medicines? Yeah, but there's also side effects with a heart attack too. So some people will argue the fact that there is an associated link between statins and dementia. And I, I think it does screw up memory because some people get their cholesterol is too low, but do you suffer a little bit of memory temporarily or do you suffer a heart attack forever? And, and that could be death. Uh, there's also about a 10% chance of uh, diabetes, especially in women when they're on statins. Again, whether you reverse the side effects or reverse the true cause of what we're trying to do here by keeping you out of the cath lab or out of the casket, you got to do something. There are a lot of so, formulas that branched off from the Framingham Heart Study from 1940s till 1970s. And uh, the Framingham Heart Study, you know, it had its flaws. No, no study is perfect, but it had its flaws, and you can use it as a directional course correction. Use it for the, its data, see how it applies to you, and course correct where you're going. You don't want to end up with, again, cancer, heart attack, stroke. So uh, the data on the Framingham, uh, there are some doctors who put together a Framingham risk score. You can look it up, Framingham Heart Risk Score and you put in your age, your sex, uh, are you a smoker, do you have diabetes? I think it asks you for your LDL cholesterol, your blood pressure, and something else, I forget. And, and it spits out a 10-year risk assessment of you going into a heart attack, and it compares you to the average population, which in the United States is terrible anyway, sorry. But, uh, and then it, again, it just gives you a measure to see if you have to move your ass or not. This is just by but, proxy showing you that there's other tests that you can in, uh, afford or get done that uh, might be better at directional change for you. Um, this is a paper that discussed, oops, that discussed saturated fats. So there's always going to be some confusion about saturated fats. The LDL, as I mentioned, the bad cholesterol is very cursory. There's other things called... LDL fractionation, LDL particle number, LP, little a, uh, and APO measurements that are, I think, more robust to tell you if you're up shit's crick or not. The only problem is those other tests, like the old Spectracell NMR, kind of expensive and a pain in the ass to draw. I'd have to draw it in my office and send it off via FedEx. Now, uh, you can kind of get, it's not nuclear magnetic resonance, but it's uh, ion tested. Quest offers it, that's fine. And I think the nuclear one you can get from a lab core. But um, anyway, uh, so there's data that shows maybe fat, saturated fats are not so good. Maybe refined, I think the bottom line with this is the information is, is evolving. And saturated fats has challenged by the low carb community. Aren't so bad. Uh, but everybody, it's a case by case basis, especially if you're what's called a hyper responder. You can't ignore LDL because the data, as I mentioned when we first started this, is too robust. There's too much stuff out there that says higher, higher amounts of bad LDL are equal to higher chances for heart attack and stroke. So you can't ignore that. But I think getting to that point where you have to, you're on the cusp of having a heart attack, there's a lot of things you can do below that on your own with a nutritionist, with the integrative medicine doctor that you, that'll steer you clear of that.
the food pyramid came out, which is ridiculous uh, and, and typical example of how some data can be stupid. Uh, but again, the food pyramid or my plate gives you kind of direction that medical nutrition therapy would probably give you better direction when you personalize it. And when you have a doctor that fine tunes it so that and gives you all the data points you need to empower change. So a uh, nutritionist has to be involved somehow. So this is my blood test order sheets. And uh, I wanted to show you, this is what I put together since I uh, started my own uh, office. This is uh, heart health. So this here's heart health. And I have the standard uh, lipid that I used to do with um, the patients I saw for the last five years. And that's fine because going and go, going to the fancy stuff is a little bit pricey. So if we don't want to, if we don't have the cash to spend on the fancy stuff, or if we are at the age of 30 or 40 and healthy exercising, I just go with that metric, the standard ones and kind of fine tune and watch the patient over the course of several years. But if you had somebody that's high risk and smoking and genetics are there, I'd probably invest in the fancier ones. So hopefully you can see that. You might want to ask your doctor if they can order it, but doctor has to know what they're talking about. And most of my, some doctors do, but most of my colleagues are just too stressed out and don't invest in continued learning. Uh, and I'm on my own now, and I really have to read because I want to be better than the average doc and give you more options. It's not me being better than anybody, me giving you more options than standard practice, especially if you're going to spend more time. And you're coming to see me, finding me outside of insurance. I have to invest more time so that you're successful and you won't need anybody. Maybe you'll need me in like two years, but. So this is just a link to show you how obesity is a risk factor. Uh, information from uh, Washington University in uh, collaboration with a university in Greece showed that the risk uh, initiation for cardiovascular uh, uh, response was important because obesity was found to increase. Obesity was directly associated with uh, increased cardiovascular morbidity. It's a nice study by Toth. A pretty good uh, summary on, uh, I liked it because he talked about the pathophysiology and uh, he's one of the lipid experts that's out there. The reason I liked to read his review was that he first talked about nutrition change, personalized nutrition change, medical nutrition therapy. And then he talked about prescriptions and then he talked about fish oil, which is kind of good if you want to review this, uh, and the risk and benefits. Cochrane so, seems to be a nice data review board or association that reviews all other things that were put out in the past. So you have to be careful. A lot of the studies out there are produced by questionable sources, but then there's some good data out there and you have to kind of sift through good and bad. And if you only do this on an every once in a while basis, you might be lured into reading something that was put on a blog post. Don't, don't do that. I think by searching on PubMed and then knowing the authors and the institutions that come up with these, don't just go by the abstract, actually read the whole thing. I just shortened the uh, production of these uh, handouts because the paper is so expensive. I showed you the Crestor, which is one of the statins. Crestor is uh, better than uh, atorvastatin. There's a whole bunch of different statins and Crestors. There are different properties from the different statins, but some are good, some are not so good. But the typical treatment plan now is high dose statin to lower your risk, meaning lower your LDL standard as fast as possible. I think that nutrition will do that and lifestyle will do that and exercise will do that. But sometimes if you have the genetic makeup of having a heart attack or you're like 50 and you smoke, you're, you're even if you don't have symptoms, you're right at the cusp of having a major heart attack. Check out Dean Ornish's work. Dean Ornish is a doctor out of California who followed some of the possible bypass patients that he became, uh, that he changed to non-bypass, but it's pretty tough. Uh, his usual method is nutrition, mindful practice, exercise, group therapy, but the nutrition's tough, low fat and vegan. And that's Huff, that's a tough sell, if you ask me, For especially if I'm talking to a 30 to 40 year old that doesn't have any symptoms and we're just giving him threats or her threats that the blood tests aren't getting anywhere. Or the exercise that you're not doing, you're going to pay for it sooner or later. So uh, it's tough to get that subset to change life until I either show them on paper or they start to have symptoms. And if you have symptoms, it's not too late, but you've got to love 
big uphill climb. Uh, so this was uh, information about uh, statins for type 2 diabetes uh, and that it had a 10 to 12 percent chance. So if you want to look that one up, you can read that one. Type 2 diabetes is not good because type 2 diabetes also increases your chances for a major heart attack or cardiovascular event. But again, you have to weigh the risk to benefit ratio. And if lowering and bottoming out with an like an anchor, your LDLP or LP little a, or your apoprotein C3, if lowering that as fast as possible decreases your chances, I'd say take that side effect, deal with the 10 to 12% possible prediabetes later. We can always, when you change your lifestyle, get you off of the statin, and then you'll get rid of the type 2 diabetes. But most likely, if you are that high risk where you have to be bottomed out, you probably already have diabetes. So, risk versus benefits, get yourself out of the trajectory of the bypass or the cardiac cath lab, and then think about taking care of the lifestyle by uh, fine tuning. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about medicines. This is about Zidia. Zidia also had some nice data that it helped. It helped to block the absorption, but there are side effects to medicines. So I mentioned typically statins can give you muscle aches, uh, maybe brain fog, uh, joint pain. Those are those are the ones, the, the side effects, and they're not common. Not everybody that has a statin has it, but in some cases, if you pull off the statin for six months and you maybe supplement with CoQ10, uh, you should be able to see the reversal, and then you get started back again on a different statin or, or nutritional therapy or, uh, again, Zidia. So Zidia is not as strong in the data as far as... Um, um, taking away the risk factors has statins have uh, presented, but still it's something. It'll probably push you a little bit harder, faster, so you get out of harm's way. Uh, this is the uh, American Diabetic Association's information about nutritional therapy being important. Now, the only problem is that they talked about how uh, one size fits all doesn't fit. Uh, so if, if you go to a doctor's office and they say, here's your DASH diet, read it, and I'll see you in three months, you're going to fail. I hate to say it, but the, the, hopefully you don't, but the statistics show that if you just take this and you're empowered by a piece of paper with black ink on it, that's not going to stop you when you're hungry. It's not going to stop you when you're in pain. not going to stop you when you're bored. So the idea is to have that medical therapy designed for you. And I'll put a link down below for a podcast that I did with a very good plant-based nutritional therapist. And she doesn't just give plant-based to anybody. She just is very good. She happens to be plant-based like me. But um, uh, please consider getting extra help. As far as using the dietitian at the hospital, I, they are knowledgeable because they had to pass a regulatory test. But the thing is, Anytime you go to an insurance-based provider, they're, they're t timed, they're truncated because they, they're paid for, they have a salary by a big organization, and the longer they spend, although it might be helpful for you, uh, the more they get in trouble, just like me. That's why I left. The longer I spent to empower my patients, it was really a good feeling for me, but I kept on getting in trouble. Not only that, uh, it would lower my paycheck, and my poor wife uh, had to deal with um, that. Bottom line is that we have to help. As healers, we have to help. The root word of doctor, physician, means to teach. And that's what I'm trying to do with these videos. So this is another study about reducing uh, saturated fats. You can uh, play it by ear, but uh, I, I think the bottom line is changing your diet because it got you to this point will probably be the first step to reversal of the disease process. And if you can't reverse it, get help. If you can't, still can't reverse it, fix the uh, deficiencies, which we'll talk about now. And if you still can't reverse it, or if you're in deep trouble, get on the medicines for a short time, but you still have to work on that nutrition. You'll have to read the data on your own and see if you agree with a low carbohydrate community allowing saturated fats or the plant-based community pushing away saturated fats. I think there's benefits to all types of intentional nutrition change. The bottom line would be where you get your guidance from, who's available in your area, and with the internet, you should be able to contact anybody. Uh, the question would be payment and or affordability. But read on your own. Try it on your own. Get some markers before you try. Get markers after if your doctor will allow you. And you can see the difference on your own. This is a yeah, funny yeah. study because it, it, it was done on college guys. And they only, it was a small study. They only took uh, college guys and they gave them 2.7 grams of phytosterols. That's plant-based cholesterol. It gave them 2.7 grams. And it did show that there was some improvement. And they compared... The, the, the base was giving the college guys ground beef, 
but in half of the college guys, they gave ground beef and a plant sterile. The other half, they just gave ground beef and a placebo. But the plant sterile seemed to do something with the numbers. The thing is, uh, with plant sterols, you got to be careful because um, I'll just briefly talk about how plant sterols work. They're, they're plant cholesterol molecules. So if you eat it, you have plant cholesterol in your gut. And part of the problem of, of cholesterol is the reabsorption because your liver tries to spit out extra cholesterol and bile. And then hopefully uh, high fibrous foods will pull that bile and cholesterol out in your toilet. But sometimes, especially with low fiber and a maybe poor um, microbiome, the cholesterol gets reabsorbed. So the stuff that the liver is trying to save you from gets put back into the liver and the liver will say, why are you here again? So uh, the theory is that if you have a plant sterile, the plant's cholesterol will hit the receptor in the small intestine that is responsible for reabsorbing the cholesterol. So the rate limiting step is how many receptors you'll fill up. So if you technically hit all those receptors with plant sterile, which you cannot use, then your regular cholesterol gets put out into the poop. Mm, makes sense, right? But the problem is plant sterols, sometimes there are some very limited papers that show plant sterols are worse at leading to cardiovascular disease than your regular cholesterol. So although it might be novel to maybe try to bring your numbers down, I would be careful about plant sterols. I think there's other things like omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 oils always come into play. I think that a lot of people will go ahead and, and by assumption, take an omega-3 oil in addition to their multivitamin. I don't like multivitamins. I do like omega-3s. Uh, I'm plant-based, but I don't have a problem with spending less money on fish oil and I just try to maximize on DHA. So uh, check out my other videos on how to utilize the omega-3 oils in whether it's fish or krill or plant-based, algae-based. Check out the video so you have some guidance. But I try for at least 1,400 milligrams of total omega-3 twice a day. If you do have cholesterol, I don't have cholesterol issues, but if you do have cholesterol issues, go for 2,000 twice a day, just have to be careful because there have been some studies that showed some questionable issues with uh, the use of omega-3 causing uh, problems with arrhythmia. Arrhythmia is a weird, funky beat with regards to the heart, like atrial fibrillation, if you've ever heard that. But uh, again, some of the data said that omega-3s in big reviews didn't really do anything as far as changing around overall comorbid conditions or death. Some said krill is actually okay, especially with ischemic heart disease. So uh, krill can help with, uh, because it's a phospholipid without getting too deep into that. Krill is an oil, it's from a sustainable uh, group of animals, krill. And uh, at this point in time, there's a lot of krill, especially in uh, cold water versus fish. And some people don't trust fish because of mercury. Uh, krill eats algae, so they don't really, and they eat insects. So they don't have to worry about a mercury issue as much, but the question is, will krill markedly change the risk factors like fish oil will? And it does show that it will help. In addition, it helps with brain, it helps with joint pain, inflammation. So I think it's worthwhile and you can get relatively cheap. Um, the plant-based or algae-based uh, ALA, I don't think works as well. Uh, one in three people can't even convert that over to usable forms. So uh, check out my videos and I'll give you some help. Uh, niacin also helps with lowering triglycerides, and as I was alluding to before, triglycerides that are high, insulin that's resistant, or if you're insulin resistant, and then elevated glucose, in addition to a low HDL, I think is more predictive than the all the LDL stuff that I'm mentioning here. So whether you have no choice and you have to follow total the old standard total cholesterol LDL calculated, or you can maybe spend more money, get the standard pro, uh, profile in addition to a fractionated profile. Uh, again, review my blood orders and you can see what I usually get. I don't get all of them at the same time. It kind of depends uh, piecemeal for some patients, but uh, you get your markers, you make the change and you repeat the markers and you see if the change worked. Now you can typically see lower fat, lower waistline, uh, more muscle, and that's one indication, but don't just go by that. Uh, this is a study that the one I talked about that uh, the reduce it trial where omega-3s did work to decrease triglycerides. 
And this talked about, like the toast study, talked about the arrhythmias that some people would suffer from. Guidance. This was on red yeast rice, my favorite. This is where uh, statins first came up. Red yeast rice uh, is a fungus. Uh, I think it either started in Japan or started in uh, China, but they found that people who use the fungus for other re means, they would lower their cholesterols. And they, if, if you follow consumer labs, they will review a lot of the supplements over the counter. And I like what they came up with as far as the monocholines that you'll find in some red yeast rice uh, companies over the sh on the shelf. So see, see my video on that as well. But that might be the first step before getting into statins. Uh, but again, if, if you're on red yeast rice and omega-3 oil and maybe plus or minus niacin and increased fiber for lowering your comorbid states, cool. I don't know if I'd use all that stuff forever. I think that if you use it for the time being, show a change in the metrics, whether it's your biometrics or the blood tests, then great. Pull off of that once you get to a good level and then see if you can maintain those metrics. I think at this point, I gave you enough data. Uh, bottom line is that uh, the the tests that we do to make sure that you're not going to have a heart attack or stroke are there. If you go with standard testing, be cautious because I think uh, old standards are not that great if you look at the data. Again, the data cannot be ignored. I know there's new information that's being morphed and it changes the risk factor stratification and the advice, but I think it's, uh, uh, it's also nice to see like the low carb community kind of pushing through and forcing the old data to be fine-tuned. So bottom line is I think we eat too much and we eat crappy food and we don't exercise enough. So if you do have uh, the threat, while you're changing all that stuff, if you do have the potential threat for a sudden heart attack, a stent or a stroke, I think it'd be important to look at some of the data that I came up with, change life a little bit while you're waiting for that life to manifest change. Supplements will help. If you're really at high risk, then prescriptions are necessary. But bottom line is, even if you came to me and we got you off of statins, if you gained all the weight back because of COVID, uh, you might have to go back on those statins. If you're not seeing me, you're going to hear it from your doctor because I don't know if they do the same kind of practice that I do as far as integrative medicine. But if you if it rubs you the wrong way and you want to get back to what you're doing with me, empower yourself, do the data, follow me on YouTube, maybe come to see me uh, virtually or in my office in Huffman Estates. And I'll be having a lot with my coaches at the Endorphin Effect, a lot of community lectures to empower you guys. So uh, follow me on Herbal411. Otherwise, I appreciate you watching up until this point. Put your comments down below and I'll see you at the next video.